Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar entitled Demonstrating Value, Health Economics in Laboratory Medicine. My name is Colleen String, and I'll be moderating today's session on behalf of Abbott and in partnership with LabRoot. If you have any questions during the session, please simply type them into the Ask a Question box and click Send. I'll be reviewing them throughout the presentation, and there will, of course, be time at the end of the presentation for questions as well. Should you experience any technical difficulties and or have any trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, please also use that same Q&A box. It is now my privilege to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Chris McCabe. Dr. McCabe is the Executive Director and CEO of the Institute of Health Economics and brings more than 25 years of experience as a health economist to his role with IHE. Originally trained in the UK, Dr. McCabe held full professorships at the universities of Sheffield, Warwick, and Leeds, and was more recently a professor of health economics at the University of Alberta, where he was appointed Capital Health and Dow Research Chair, leading research groups focused on the evaluation, adoption, and implementation of precision medicine technology. He has also served on the Canadian Agency for Drugs and Technology in Healthcare's Health Economics Working Group. More recently, Dr. McCabe advised the Patented Medicine Price Review Board on the technical issues related to the revision of the regulations for setting the price of new drugs in Canada, and he is currently the chair of the Royal Society of Canada COVID Task Force Working Group on the Economy. Welcome, Dr. McCabe. The stage is yours. Thank you very much, Colleen, and thank you for the uh, opportunity to speak to you all today. Uh, so, um, uh, Listening to that, I, I, I think um, it's just proof that if you hang around long enough, you, you will get to do interesting things. Um, so today, um, starting off with the, the disclosure, the, we received, IHE has received support uh, for today's work from Abbott, uh, and, and I'm making this presentation at the request of Abbott. I'm employed by the Institute of Health Economics, uh, and other than that, I have uh, no conflicts of interest to declare. Uh, quick overview, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, clinical testing uh, and uh, there's a quote from the Merck Manual which kind of uh, is, is my touchstone for thinking about clinical testing and, and what it's all about. So uh, I, I tend to start presentations like that with, with a quote from, from, from the Merck Manual because I just think it, it's, it's always really useful to remember uh, that everything people like me do is, is to try and improve what happens in healthcare for patients, and uh, if we ever lose sight of that, then then we're uh, we're in the wrong job, and we need to go away and do something else. Uh, so I, I'll, I'll start you with that quote. Uh, I hope you'll bear with me. Then I'm going to talk about uh, test evaluation pathway a little bit uh, because that. You know, there's, there's been a lot of test evaluation for, for decades, and, and there's some fantastic experts. Uh, and I want to just highlight where health economics, think really the, the new kid on the block in this space, where it fits in. Uh, and then I'll get into uh, the, the, the meat of the presentation around cost effectiveness analysis, uh, the, the, the most immediately relevant part of the health economic toolkit. Uh, and, and how cost effectiveness analysis relates to this concept of value and how we, uh, uh, how we can use cost effectiveness analysis to be confident that when we uh, adopt new technologies that they are actually adding value to the health service, to the health system and, and therefore thereby improving um, outcomes for the patients that we serve. Then uh, talk about uh, value in laboratory medicine and uh, there's a little bit of algebra there, but I'm not going to spend a great deal of time on it. It's, uh, uh, you know, there's, there's actually quite a, a long-standing body of, uh, of methods for this. Uh, and, and truth be told, they've, they've not been widely used until precision medicine turned up. And, and precision medicine has really uh, brought those methods into their own. And so then I'm going to, you know, outline those concepts, how that all works, and then talk very specifically about value and precision medicine because uh, that, that's where a lot of the, the hot button issues uh, in laboratory medicine and the adoption of new technologies and therefore where people are looking to health economics to see if we can help uh, resolve. Uh, 
uh, the questions and the challenges, and then we'll have a uh, uh, some time for uh, questions uh, from yourself. So do please put your questions uh, in in the box, uh, and um, Colleen will then uh, uh, quiz me with them uh, in that period. So I look forward to that, and I always uh, learn things from the questions that people ask me. So thanks a lot, and we'll get on with the presentation. So this is a stage from the Merck manual, uh, and I think the thing I, I want to highlight is, uh, you know, they, I, I put them in, in highlighted them in, in a sort of red color. So tests may help make a diagnosis in symptomatic patients or identify occult disease in asymptomatic patients. Laboratory tests are imperfect, and that's really important to recognize. Um, that means that we they are not free of harm. Okay. Doing a test carries a risk of harm to the patient because it may give us the wrong answer. So we may get both false positives and the other way around false negatives. Uh, and we do things to patients in response to the results of tests. Uh, and uh, we don't want to do things to patients that we won't benefit from them. Next thing it says is the test ability to correctly include or exclude disease depends on how likely a person is to have a disease. They call this the prior probability, as well as the test's intrinsic operating characteristics. So the, the, the operating characteristics of the test are portable and generalizable to a fair degree, but the characteristics of populations vary. The prior probability of disease varies across populations, and so you have to think about both when you're thinking about uh, the performance of a test. We, we can't just assume that because it performs in, well in one, uh, population, it's good value in one population, it's necessarily going to be good value in another. Um, and and the, I, I really like this final bit. The, the diagnostic test is a critical contributor to clinical decision making. Testing can have undesired and unintended consequences and therefore testing must be done with deliberation and purpose and with the expectation that the test result will re reduce ambiguity and contribute to the patient's health. So it shouldn't be automatic that a test is ordered. There needs to be a critical clinical thought process that leads to the ordering of a test so that you can explain why it's done. So th this is the kind of foundation I try to keep in the back of my mind when I'm thinking about tests and the evaluation of tests. So as I said a little earlier, the evaluation of tests has been going on a long time uh, before health economics came on the scene. Really, uh, we're the new kids on the blocks. Uh, we, you know, lab laboratories have long been interested in analytic validity, the technical performance uh, of a test. Um, they haven't thought so much about measurement uncertainty, but it's becoming more of an issue. Uh, uncertainty in test performance. Uh, that are driven by variations in the analytic processes in the laboratory are becoming uh, uh, increasingly part of what is considered. And there are many other components of test evaluation. And, and health economics, this cost effectiveness over here, is, is just one of them. We've got, you know, we're concerned about measurement, we're concerned about clinical accuracy, clinical utility, and then cost effectiveness, and then the broader implications. Uh, uh, of the use of the test. So, you know, we're, health economics is only one part of the uh, of the test evaluation pathway, and it's very much the new kid on the block. And I think it's very incumbent upon people like myself to be suitably um, modest uh, and cautious in uh, in statements about what we understand and what we don't understand. There's uh, many disciplines and professionals who've been working in this space for a long time and it's incumbent upon us to listen and learn from them and be very clear about what it is that we add in, adi in addition to their expertise and when our expertise may or may not be relevant because we're not always relevant. I mean, you know, it's, we're not the answer to everything, strange to say. Uh, economics generally and health economics specifically is not relevant to every question that we have in a, in a health policy space. And, um, And to be honest, 
historically test evaluations by HTA bodies like NICE in the UK and Cardiff here in Canada have tended not to, to, to look too much inside the black box of laboratory testing. So uh, my colleague of mine, Alison Smith at the University of the UK did a nice systematic review uh, and showed that HTAs, um, only 19% of them identified some aspect of uh, performance measurement in, in, in evaluating the test. So you know, that really is uh, quite small, a low level of performance. So you know that health economics reaching in inside the black box of the laboratory and, and drawing on the expertise of the people who have worked in that space for a long time is something I think we need to do. Uh, we need to do better at that. And so uh, one of the things I, the reason I said yes to this is, is it's an opportunity for uh, me as a health economist to reach out to the laboratory medicine community and, and, and share what we do and how we think about things uh, and, and have an opportunity to build those relationships so that I can learn from the community about what you do and how you do it. And, and hopefully we can find points of complementarity uh, where we can uh, improve both uh, what we do uh, and maybe contribute a little bit to what you do. So when we think about measurement uncertainty, we're interested in, in, in precision, precision and truth. Um, so the, the precision is about the closeness of agreement between repeated tests, what the degree of random error. And I, I really like this. Again, this is from my colleague Alison Smith uh, at the University of Leeds in the UK, where we, you know, we, ideally we want low levels of imprecision and low bias. So here we have, on the left hand side, we have a, you know, that's our ideal test. Um, if we have imprecision but low bias, well, you know, we've got a, lot, a great deal of uncertainty, but the expected value is, is still good. Uh, so we're doing okay on, on, on the truth, the trueness of, our, 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 of the measure. Uh, we, in some ways, I worry most about the, the third one or the second from the right hand side, the low imprecision and high bias because if you don't know about the bias you think you're very certain about the test uh, and that can give you great confidence in doing the wrong thing which is almost a the, the worst case scenario uh, and on the uh, right hand side we have uh, both imprecision and bias uh, and, and, and that's well that's the lowest level of performance from a decision perspective uh, because you would see the high level of imprecision uh, in practice, you, you, that, that would likely urge caution. So I, I really like this way of thinking about precision and trueness and, and how labs think about, uh, conventionally think about uh, measurement uncertainty in test performance. Uh, and it's a, a really important input to value assessment. But uh, I think what we're saying is health economics is, you know, getting low imprecision and low bias, that's not the end of the story to establish bias, a, a value. We want that uh, and we want that as an input to the process of establishing value. Uh, and, and, you know, health economics is really all about value. Uh, okay, next. So, apologies for people on this uh, uh, webinar who know this stuff. I'm not wasn't sure about the range of knowledge and expertise of the of the audience, so I've uh, I've included some pretty fun foundational things just to make sure everyone's uh, on the same level, and then uh, we'll build up from there. Uh, admittedly, I'm going to build up pretty quickly, uh, but uh, I, I thought it was worth making sure we have the same shared uh, basic building blocks uh, in place. So, what is economic evaluation? So, economic evaluation is the comparative analysis of alternative courses of action in terms of their costs and consequences. So it has to be comparative, so it can't just be one thing, and it has to consider both costs and consequences. So a cost analysis is not an economic evaluation. You know, if you tell me how much something costs, it's interesting. If I was just an accountant, I'd be thrilled with that piece of information, but I don't know whether it's good value because I don't know what I get for that cost. Similarly, reporting the costs and outcomes of a single course of action, that's not an economic evaluation either because I don't know whether that is better or worse than the alternative. And there is always an alternative. Doing nothing is always an option. 
and doing nothing will have costs and consequences associated with it. So an active intervention, if there's only one active intervention, we should still ask ourselves, does this produce different outcomes and at what additional cost, or cost saving possibly, does it, does it do so compared to just doing nothing? I, I love that, 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 that phrase that um, educators uh, in, in medicine, I, I have a number of colleagues who are medical educators, and they say one of the hardest things is, is, is to, to get doctors to understand that you know, sometimes their job is, is just to stand there and do nothing. You know, we're naturally called to intervene. You know, that idea of don't just stand there, do something. Well, actually, sometimes just stand there and do nothing is the better course of action. And in economic evaluation, we want to ask whether that is the better course of action in terms of its costs and outcomes. So there's always a comparator. So economic evaluation has to be comparative and it has to consider both costs and consequences of different actions. Why do we need it? Well, we need it because we do not have enough resources to fulfill all of the needs that we would want. Everything that humanity we want to do, um, you know, the, uh, uh, the estimate is we're getting through resources on planet Earth uh, at about a rate that we'd need two and a half planet Earths to sustain. You know, so we, we, we are not respecting scarcity very well. Uh, if we're realistic, we, we can't pay for everything. So we have to make choices. Uh, and therefore, we use this concept in economics called opportunity cost, really foundational to, to the whole field of economics, which is the opportunity cost of an action is the next best use of the resources that are consumed by that action. Okay. Economic evaluation aims to ensure that the benefits of interventions or programs that we do implement are greater than their opportunity cost. You know, so what we get is more valuable than what we give up. Uh, and we do that to help target scarce resources where they will do what is most valuable. And this uh, you know, quote from the, the World Bank back in 1993. Cost effectiveness analysis is one form of economic evaluation. Broadly, there are three forms. There's cost effectiveness analysis, where resource utilization is measured using monetary, in monetary terms. And the outcome is measured in natural units, clinical units, so, uh, so life years, changes in HbA1c in diabetes, uh, changes in uh, your blood pressure measurement, uh, changes in your cholesterol. Uh, those are all pure cost effectiveness analysis. Cost benefit analysis is, is, is the form of economic evaluation that's used more broadly outside of health because it, it puts a monetary value on the outcome, the effects of an intervention. And, and for a long time, there's been a, a discomfort with putting a monetary value on health on lives. People in healthcare are uncomfortable with that. And so there's, there's been a, a, a reluctance to use cost benefit analysis in health and healthcare in the same way that it's used in other areas such as transport and environment and, and defense and, and education. So uh, health economics has, has come up with a third form uh, of economic evaluation which is cost utility analysis um, where obviously resource use is, is valued in monetary terms but the outcomes are valued in terms of the of what we call utilities so that the, the, the preference for being in a particular health state uh, and the duration of those, that health state. So we quality adjusted life years uh, is the summary measure used in, in, uh, in, in cost utility analysis. And I'll say a little bit more about uh, those in a moment. So cost utility analysis is so widely used in uh, economic evaluation in health that it's often referred to as cost effectiveness analysis. It's regarded as a more sophisticated version of cost effectiveness analysis. Uh, comparisons between interventions are made in terms of the incremental cost effectiveness ratio, and I'll define that shortly. Uh, effects are measured in terms of healthy years, where, and healthy years 
are captured on this multi-dimensional utility-based measure. So utility, just think of it as value or preference or satisfaction. Okay, um, and it combines the duration of life with some judgment about the quality of your health during that time, during those years of life. And, and you know, I, when I'm giving this uh, presentation like this to purely clinical audiences, I ask them, what, what does healthcare do? Um, and uh, often I, I don't immediately get an answer, and uh, then I'll say, are there any doctors in the audience? Surely you know it is, what it is that you do, and that you lead every day, and, and there's a little bit of shuffling, and, and then we get a discussion going. And we tend to arrive quite comfortably that, you know, what healthcare does is it improves our life expectancy and or the quality of our life during that period. And the, the quality adjusted life year is just an attempt to, to provide an index that conceptually can capture the outcomes of different types of healthcare. So hip replacements versus coronary surgery versus uh, uh, blood pressure measurement versus chemotherapy. All of them are trying to uh, improve our quality of life and our length of life. And, and they're all calling on the same healthcare budget. So we need a single measure of benefit, of outcome, of effect, in order to identify which are producing the most benefit per dollar spent. Uh, so as I said, that's the quality adjusted life year, conceptually what it is. Um, and the utility, utility is a measure of preference. Uh, and it, 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 it sits on this scale where uh, full health or perfect health is given a value of one, dead or health states where you would be indifferent between continuing to live in that health state and being dead are given a value of zero. And health states that are worse than death, you know, we know there's some people who find themselves in health states where they say, say I would rather be dead than remain in this health state. Well, those are, are, are given a negative value, okay? And we combine the utility values, they're the weight that we apply to the survival data to produce qualities. So it's a really simple illustration. Imagine you, you, you've got a health problem, your current health state has a utility of 0.5, and your life expectancy is two years. So that means without intervention, you expect to live another quality, to receive one quality over the remainder of your life. If you undergo the operation, your health state utility increases to 0.9, your life expectancy expands to five years, and that means you'll get 4.5 points. Your expectation, if you have the operation, is another 4.5 qualities over your five years of life expectancy. So the quality gain from the operation is 3.5 qualities. And here it is graphically, and this is just to highlight Actually, incremental qualities are just the difference in the area under of quality adjusted life expectancy. Because obviously, survival curves don't take these sorts of shapes. Yeah? But just to illustrate that that's actually what we're doing, we're just extra extrapolating or predicting life expectancy with a quality adjustment for uh, the actual health over that life expectancy, and then calculating the difference in the area under the curve to capture the benefit of the intervention, which I think is intuitively a reasonable thing to do. So, talks about cost effectiveness ratios. Uh, cost effectiveness ratio presents the average cost effectiveness of an intervention. So, it's the total costs of the intervention divided by the total qualities from that intervention. We're not actually interested in the cost effectiveness ratio because that's not comparative. What we're interested in is the incremental cost effectiveness ratio, which we, uh, you know, if that's the, uh, if that's the comparative, the way that we make sure an economic valuation is comparative. So we often call this the ISA, and it's quite simply the difference in the expected costs between the two interventions divided by the difference in the qualities between the two interventions. So it's a really simple concept. And, and it's just asking for every additional unit, every additional quality, how much extra money do we have to spend? Okay? 
So that's all it is. It's, it's, you know, if you know how much more you have to spend and how much more health you get for it, then you can make a judgment about whether the additional health is worth the additional expenditure. Okay. So now I want to talk to you about how we use this incremental cost effectiveness uh, ratio uh, to make sure that our reimbursement decisions are coherent with uh, maximizing the value that we get from our limited healthcare budget. So I'm going to start off with asking you to imagine a really simple, small healthcare system. And I want, this is a value proposition, okay? The value proposition is that interventions that produce more health per thousand dollars spent are better value than those that produce less. Okay, so that's a value proposition. If you don't accept that, then you will not accept that cost effectiveness analysis is a good way to allocate limited healthcare resources. The other thing that we have to accept is that the health system has a limited budget. If you think that resources are not scarce, then again, you won't accept the need for cost effectiveness analysis uh, or economics at all, in fact. So, uh, what I'm going to do is this health system produces a, provides a, a, a portfolio of technologies. But eventually, that uh, portfolio of technologies exhausts the available budget. And I just want to highlight something important here. Uh, and again, this is a value proposition. If we are going to adopt a new technology, it should produce at least as much health per thousand dollars spent as the least valuable, the least efficient technology that we currently provide. Okay? So this is our operationalization of the idea of opportunity cost. A, if we adopt a new technology, what we give up, this technology, we should give up the least valuable technology that produces the least health in order to pay for it, or the least health per thousand dollars spent in order to pay for it. So now we've, we've always got treatments that aren't covered and which patients and their manufacturers would like us to cover. Uh, and using that decision rule, uh, we can quickly say, okay, well, this one's worse than the current least valuable, uh, as is this one. And so we don't need to worry about them. We can say no to them and we'll get rid of them. So they're gone. But these two, they're clearly better than, the least, than this one. So let's adopt the first one. So move it from that side and into that side. And there you go, in it goes, hopefully. Slightly slower animation than I'm used to uh, doing it on the web platform, but that's okay. A couple of things. One, we have had to display some care. Because the budget is fixed, to pay for this technology, we've had to display some, someone else's health care. So when people say, it's money and my life is worth more than that amount of money, Yes, but the money is somebody else's healthcare. So when we adopt a new technology and the budget isn't increased to cover the complete cost of that, then we are displacing somebody else's healthcare. We don't know who's in practice, but we know it is happening. Things we currently spend at the support have to be given up in order to pay for the new technology. That doesn't mean it's the wrong decision. It's just that's the reality. We've adopted this one because it's better. It produces more health per thousand dollars spent than this one, than what we had to give up. So that's a reasonable thing to do. We still this we have a new worst least valuable technology, and this one is still better than that. So we should adopt that too. In the same process, we displace current expense, current healthcare to pay for the new because it produces more health per thousand dollars spent. And we can see that we now have a new opportunity cost, a new measure of what we have to give up. But importantly, we can also see that the total health produced from the expenditure of the budget 
is greater than it was before we made these changes. So health, population health from the available budget has been increased. If we want the opportunity cost for the next decisions to be lower, we need to increase our budget. Now, you'll know I talked about this measure of opportunity cost as health benefit per thousand dollars spent. That's the inverse. You can flip that round and you can say it's the cost per unit of health benefit. So what this is, what this opportunity cost is, what we in everyday discussion talk about as being the cost effectiveness threshold or our willingness to pay for health, the $50,000 per quality. Okay, so flip this measure around as its inverse and express this as, as, the, as the cost effectiveness threshold. It's essentially the same thing. So when we talk about using a cost effectiveness threshold to decide whether we adopt or don't adopt a new technology, whether it's a test or anything else, we're talking about ensuring that the new technology produces more health per thousand dollars spent than the technologies that we have to give up to pay for it. So that's the link between cost effectiveness analysis and value in the health system. We can increase the value we get from our uh, limited healthcare system budget by using cost effectiveness thresholds to inform our which technologies get adopted and which don't. Okay, so that's uh, kind of found, uh, the, the, the foundation of, uh, of what we're about. Uh, okay, so thinking about lab tests and test directed care. So the good news is how you apply cost effectiveness analysis to, um, to test technologies uh, has been figured out for a long time. So this lovely paper from Phelps and Mushlin back in 1988 that set out how to optimize the test to hit a cost effectiveness target. Uh, and here's the algebra for anyone who wants to subsequently have a look through it. Uh, you can look at the paper, but the, the really central thing is as we move the, as we change the, 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 the test performance criteria, the sensitivity and the specificity, we change the cost effectiveness of a test. Um, and what uh, uh, Phelps and Mushlin showed was the optimal cut point for a test from a cost effectiveness perspective is where the gradient of the ROC curve, the receiver operating characteristic curve, is the same as the slope of the cost effectiveness threshold. So if you think cost effectiveness threshold is an incremental cost effectiveness, it's a ratio, and so it has a slope, you know, it has a gradient, and where the gradient of the ROC and the gradient of the threshold are the same, that's your optimum cut point. And so we, this is from their paper, uh, you know, two alternative cut points showing how the optimal cut point is different depending upon your cost effectiveness threshold. Okay, and just to think through a little bit about what's happening there is when you change your cut point, you change the proportion of false negative and uh, false positive cases that you get. Uh, and so you, you change how many tests lead to actions which either are not valuable or could be harmful. So the value of a test is driven by the actions it triggers and how they change the health outcomes for the patient. That's what it's about. And, and if we change the cut point, we change the proportion of tests where the action will have no or a negative value, okay? So, let's talk about precision medicine a little bit. So, precision medicine technologies are highly heterogeneous. So, to talk about precision medicine, I think, is sometimes really unhelpful. It's an umbrella, but there's a whole bunch of technologies under that. So we can just have a, a molecular test, you know, that's uh, diagnostic or that might be screening or might be monitoring. That's a precision medicine uh, technology. Uh, 
and, and it may just provide information. We can also have molecular tests, and increasingly do have molecular tests that are linked to a specific treatment, especially in cancer, where we're, we're looking at does the tumor have this specific characteristic, uh, uh, this particular molecular signature, and if so, we're confident the treatment targets that molecular signature. We could have a phenotypic test, which we then follow up with a pharmacogenomic test, which then could lead to treatment. We can have a molecular test, you know, that leads to a pharmacogenomic test that leads to treatment. So if you think of um, blacker uh, driven cancers, you might do the molecular test to guide the treatment. You then might do a pharmaco, uh, you know, a, pharma a genetic test to establish whether it's a, 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 an inherited form of the cancer. And if it's an inherited form of the cancer, the treatment may change. You know, you, you more aggressive surgery um, in ovarian cancer or breast cancer, for an example. Uh, what I'm trying to get people to understand is in, in precision medicine, there are a lot of these tests, and each test has this complexity of the true positive, false positive, true negative, false negative, which feeds in either to a treatment, but it can feed into another test, being a typic test or a, a pharmacogenomic test, and they all have these uncertainties, which drive differences in outcomes and costs. And, and when you change the the, the, the definition, the case definition, the cut point on the test, for want of a better description, it all feeds through to differences in the outcomes of, uh, of, of the treatment pathway. Uh, and we need to start thinking about this quite carefully uh, and understanding that if, if we want to um, maximize our, our access to these effective therapies, then it's not just about playing with the price. It's not just about playing with the budget that's available. We also have the ability to modify the test positive and negative case definitions to, to drive different value propositions through the system. And, and, and the challenge of these technologies is so large that I, I really think we have to use all the tools that are available to us and not you leave one or two of them on the side because, well, they, they use this case definition in the US or in Europe, so we have to use the same one. Well, that's not necessarily true. I think we need to recognize that when we're trying to get value and we're dealing with a health system with a budget and a given set of demands on that budget, which are driven by the epidemiology of disease in the population they serve, and historical factors about how the available budget is allocated and differences in the efficiency of the health systems that we can't just say well this is the price this is the definition take it or leave it for maximizing health and, and access and impact of these fascinatingly valuable potentially valuable new technologies we need to be willing to use all of the, uh, the, the tools in our toolbox we need to be willing to change the test cut point if that enables us to get to a value of the test and subsequent treatment strategies that is affordable and attractive to the health system that we're, that we're working within. Um, we can't, there is, it is unhelpful to point to other uh, health systems which have different budgets and different needs and priorities and say, well, they're paying for it, therefore you should pay for it. I, I, you know, that's not sustainable as a strategy to promote the efficient use of our limited health resources. Uh, we, we, we can't say it's fixed, it's untouchable. It's not. It's a decision we make and it's a decision that we can make informed by efficiency. So optimum use of precision medicine will be health system specific. It will require synthesis of what is often, often currently siloed data between the diagnostic, uh, genetics, effectiveness, and epidemiology. We're going to have to be a lot better at bringing all of that evidence to bear uh, in evaluating and optimizing. But if it's done right, 
I think we will see precision medicine both increase population health and impact in a good way on healthcare system expenditures. So I'm just going to do a quick example to, to show you what I think is possible. And, and there's a publication that uh, people can go away and read uh, if they wish to. So individuals' clinical pathways are frequently determined by the sequential use of one or more tests. You know, with you know, the, the, the diabetes, they you know test their blood sugar every you know few hours, if not hourly. Um, you know, you'll get monthly recalls back to your family doctor to check, check your blood pressure. Um, testing and repeated testing uh, and monitoring is, is crucial and highly frequent event in healthcare. Um, Phelps Mushlin said, here's how you optimize it for a single decision point, a single point in time. But actually, we needed to extend this for sequential testing. Um, Remember the quote from the Merck manual that says, a testability to correctly include or exclude disease depends upon how likely a person is to have that disease, the prior probability, as well as the test's intrinsic characteristics. Well, your first test result will often, you know, it will divide your initial population into two groups, the positive and the negative. And therefore, at the second test administration, you will often have a different prior probability. And that gives us an opportunity to start uh, being a bit more efficient, maybe to optimize sequential testing for value. So this is the conventional sequ sequential strategy, same cut points uh, for everybody at the same time points. So what we did was we, uh, we, we, we said, OK, what if we try to uh, recognize the change in the prior probability between the positives and the negatives after the first, at the time of the second administration of a test. What does that do? So we take for, for both of them, we've got two groups, different prior probabilities. How does that change things? Uh, and this is jumping to the end of the story, so to speak, to make sure that there's time for any questions you may have. Um, what you find is that the Optimal test point, this is uh, for um, a, a test for monitoring uh, the risk of testicular cancer, if I remember correctly, because it's about eight years ago that we did this now. Uh, the, both the test cut point and the optimal interval between testing changes. And so instead of, you know, if we go back to this, where we have everyone being tested six times, we can test these people at month three, and what we do subsequently for them will be uh, informed by the new prior probabilities. But these people, we don't need to test them till month five. So there is personalization in terms of the burden of accessing healthcare it's on the patient you know our demands of them is significantly lower because we looked to optimize the test on, on value grounds and the total number of tests is significantly lower so the health system saves money uh, and, and remember as I said earlier it's not money it's somebody else's healthcare. So it, it's not that that money is going to be given back to the insurance company or it's going to be given back to the government. Uh, it, it, it's money that's in the budget that's going to be used to pay for other people's healthcare, their needs, which may be tests, which may be test directed treatments, maybe screening, or, or maybe just family doctor visits or reducing the waiting lists for hip replacements or reducing the waiting list for uh, uh, child and adolescent mental health support. You know, it, it's not money. Money is just a mechanism for moving resources around the health system. So when we make a financial saving, we're actually producing health for other people. And, and that's got to be a good thing to do. And so getting really personal about optimizing healthcare in, and the testing component of healthcare, I think is, is a massive opportunity for us. And, and that places 
laboratory medicine and, and people like yourselves and, and the products that you produce uh, at the forefront if you want to be there of uh, increasing the efficiency of, of, of the healthcare system. Uh, so I find that exciting uh, and I, I, I hope you do too. So it's efficient to use the information in earlier tests to identify both test intervals and test cut points for subsequent uh, clinical management. Test guided management can personalize care and maximize the value of the health that's produced, which seems to me like a win-win situation for everyone involved. Summarize, adopting a value-based approach, so using cost effectiveness analysis and acknowledging limited resources to optimize test directed care, including precision medicine, can facilitate sustainable adoption in resource constrained health systems. And by the way, all health systems are resource constrained. There is a limit to every health system's budget. What happens when that limit is breached is how they differ. In private insurance systems, what happens is the, um, the premiums go up and some people can no longer afford those premiums and therefore they, they are excluded from healthcare or they can only afford a cheaper so they don't have access to the same portfolio. In publicly funded, social taxation funded healthcare systems, when we breach the budget, we have waiting lists. So we ration by time or we ration by socioeconomic status. There is no version in which we don't ration. Adopting a value-based approach to personalizing healthcare can release further resources to invest in addressing currently unmet needs. Uh, and, and that's kind of why I'm in this game. That's, that's what drives me uh, to do the work I do. So just a quick plug, a little advert at the end. Uh, we're partnering the Univance of Healthcare Excellence Program. Uh, you won't be surprised, given what I've just said, that I see uh, the, the, the relationship between laboratory medicine and health economics as a key driver and a key opportunity to improve healthcare, both quality and uh, sustainability in the future. And in and Univac's Healthcare Excellence Program, we got involved when we were invited because we see it as uh, one way that we can move that relationship forward, one way we can support uh, efficiency and quality in, in healthcare uh, within laboratory medicine. So uh, that, that's our little advert plug over, and now I will, uh, I'll, I'll stop talking at you and hopefully start talking with you and we can uh, you now happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you, Dr. McKinney, for that wonderful presentation on what is clearly an important and relevant topic in, in not just laboratory medicine, but in healthcare today. Uh, we can all appreciate not just the importance of a laboratory test, such within the laboratory, but its downstream effects um, on processes and decision making downstream, um, and the importance of being able to really measure um, what those insights do for, for decision making. So thank you so much for, for a very relevant presentation on a very important topic, um, especially as uh, which is the opening of the Univance of Healthcare Excellence Award third cycle uh, is opening. Um, so it's a very timely presentation to hear you talk about an important topic as really being able to have that strong measurement associated with changes in cost um, is a key driver for not only decision making and change, but also uh, this prestigious program of which you are a, a wonderful and valued partner for. And so with that, we will open up the, the session for some questions. And we actually have a few that have already come in. And so the first is actually a so measuring the value of new processes, which is often what lab insights enable, can be very difficult versus, say, measuring the value of a new device. Based on the information you provided and your experience, what is the best approach for actually measuring the cost and change associated with changing a process? Great question. Great question. So, so there's, there's, there's no one size fits all uh, answer to this question. How, how you best uh, measure the, the resource implications of a, a new process is uh, 
it will be health system specific. Um, and what we tend to do is we try to do it early. Uh, and so the, uh, uh, we, we start with talking to the, the, the clinicians who will be using the information and, and tell us what they think they will do in response to the information. And, and, and let's be honest, the more they use the test, the more they learn and they change what they do. So it's not a one and done process, but we, we have that. Uh, it, ideally, we, we get a, a you know a, a consensus a clinical consensus group together uh, to to get agreement on what they think they're going to do, given the health system context that they work in. Okay, um, and then once they've told us that, we can then work behind the scenes to to figure out what the resource implications and the cost of those resource implications are. One thing that's really useful in that process is you will get insights into the, the differences between what I think of as the, the the early, mid and late adopters. You know, so there will be a time at which you will have the new process trying to run in parallel with the old process and, and depending upon the the, the, the the risk attitude, for want a better phrase, of, of your clinical community in that space, uh, the, the length of that dual process uh, will, will vary, and those are, you know, those are legitimate transaction costs that we need to think about whilst we're whilst we're uh, running the implementation. So I think what we do is we, we try and figure that out, but then you monitor. Uh, it's really important not to think of this as a one and done. The best indicator of what is going to happen is, is got in those first few months of monitoring what does happen. Uh, what I have found, uh, and it kind of sounds obvious really, but, but doctors are incredibly bright people and they're incredibly good at working around the system to still do what they want to do, whether that's to be an earlier doctor or a later doctor. Or and so observing what is happening and updating your predictions. So if you're informing a decision maker or a budget holder, having shared with them that early monitoring plan so you say, look, this is what everybody says. This is what we think will happen. But these are the things we're going to do to monitor so that we can flag up to you if the expected trajectory on the cost side of things and if things are rapidly enough in process, the expected trajectory on the outcome side of things aren't being observed. So you want to equip the decision maker, whoever the budget holder is, with, with, with some risk management tools. So do your best to describe what you expect to happen given the clinician's uh, perspective and the knowledge and evidence about the technology and, and the other components of the process. But don't do a one and done. Um, you know, we, we, we had a, a, an evaluation not so long ago of a, 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 a test for, uh, for uh, breast cancer uh, to guide therapy in breast cancer. And because we monitored what was actually able to happen, we the decision maker actually hit pause on the attempt to change practice after about 12 months. Because the amount of money that was being spent on the exceptional review uh, to try and, you know, the, the doctors were using to keep doing what they were determined to keep doing, uh, completely wiped out any savings in the long run. So if we'd sustained it, we'd have made a, you know, a net loss. Even though the evidence said you should do X, Y, and Z, and the doctor said, oh, yes, we'll do X, Y, and Z, what they actually did, which was, in their mind, what they thought was best for their patients, meant that it wasn't worth persisting. The, 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 the benefit of the change was completely eaten up by the transaction costs of the change as the doctors worked their way around it. So I, I hope that's answered the question you had. It's a, it's a very good highlights a few key points. Of course, the importance of continuously measuring, but also the importance of getting stakeholder buy-in when you're looking to change processes. Uh, changing processes or tests or, or what have you in silos doesn't always have the net effect that you're looking for. And so it's, it's actually a fantastic point to bring up in light of your, your second last slide with the Healthcare Excellence Award Program which really to celebrate those teams who have not just made a measurable impact, but unified beyond their, their small silos 
and, and work together as teams to have those measurable impacts. So it's a wonderful point that you bring up um, and, and really highlights the importance of measurement and, and working together um, as teams. So thank you very much. Now, I think we probably have time for one, possibly two more questions. Looks like you've piqued the interest from, from teams all over the world. So your next question is, is there aid relating to achieving better health economic evaluation in third world countries? So there is uh, uh, both the, uh, there's an organization called INATA, the International uh, Network of HCA Agencies, and Health Technology Assessment International, and just recently the World Health Organization have moved into uh, having, creating a focus on uh, HGA support uh, to support the development of HGA capacity uh, in uh, 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 low and middle income countries. And uh, so what I can do is I can send, uh, if I send the information, the link through to you, Colleen, can you share that uh, with the attendees so that uh, we can, you know, they, they, they know where to look. But yeah, it's uh, it's an increasingly important priority, uh, and you know, important organisations are starting to put resources around helping it happen well. Outstanding, wonderful. Well, it sounds like we have time for one more question, um, and so um, this question is: the need for a comparator um, is or a baseline can sometimes be very difficult. Um, for example, knowing that that thousand dollars per health benefit. Um, do you have any suggestions or best practices for getting that baseline in order a comparator is readily available for a health economic evaluation? So, if you have access to, to routine data, if you're in a health system that has access, you know, it enables you to have access to routine data. Looking at the data to identify what happens to the patients who who have the clinical indication is really useful. I think you know we we've got into this in the uh, the rare diseases space where you know patients go on these uh, diagnostic odysseys through the health system before they they finally arrive at a definitive diagnosis, and and so uh, that you know that's what we have. Uh, tended to do to uh, to look in the routine data. If you haven't got routine data, then you, you you're stepping back in terms of uh, the robustness of the information to use expert opinion. Get the clinicians, the clinical teams to tell you what happens. But don't just I, there, there's good and bad ways of doing that. Okay. So uh, the more that's at stake, the bigger the budget and play for the decision the more it's worth looking at some formal uh, expert elicitation methods where you that the, the structured question processes that allow you to get quantitative expressions of their expert beliefs so they don't they, they don't just tell you well we do x they tell you the probability that they'll do x and the uncertainty around that probability which gives you information you can directly embed in your uh, decision analytic model. Uh, so again, there's some nice literature around using expert elicitation in places where there isn't evidence. And, and I, again, I'll share uh, a couple of uh, links with Colleen around that uh, methods set and, and, and uh, Colleen will send them on to everybody. Wonderful, thank you so much, Dr. McCabe. And thank you again for, for the wonderful presentation. Um, it looks like we are out of time. Um, we do have some additional questions that have been coming in. And so rest assured, your questions will be answered um, through email after. Um, and so I'd like to thank you for joining us today. I would like to thank Labrus and as well as IHE, which is a brilliant partner of the Universal Healthcare Excellence Award Program, um, which was founded in partnership with several other um, societies around the world um, that are leaders in transformational healthcare. And so um, to close and, and really help wrap up this presentation, um, which really highlights the importance of measurement, uh, key stakeholders, including uh, the payer, we invite anyone on this call as well as other interrelated
clinical care teams to visit the Univons of Healthcare Excellence Award website. And if you do have any questions, please contact the, the administrative portal um, for any questions as, as it's a very relevant and important award program that's grown substantially in the last three years. And so if there are any questions related to that, please do also reach out. And you can also visit uh, the Univons of Healthcare Excellence Award website and or IAT um, for more information. And so before we go, um, I will just say thank you again to Dr. McCabe and to IAT for their wonderful partnership with the program and wonderful presentations today. Thank you so much. Thanks everyone, it's been a real pleasure.